All right, all right, all right, all right, all right. It's a little bit warmer. I mean, we've been battling like 60s and cloudy, and we haven't got into the bees um, because I've been waiting for it to get a little more sunny out, and then they were getting a warm day, then they were getting some coldy, cloudy, rainy days. And Dr. Leo and I have been talking on the phone. And in case you guys are new here, uh, Dr. Leo and I produce v B videos uh, to help you guys out. And uh, together we produce videos that have well over a million views on them. And we try to put out a lot of information and open source information uh, to help you guys out uh, on your bee journey if you're just starting out. Or if you're kind of like me, I was already into it for a few years and uh, learned some stuff. Uh, studying with Dr. Leo here and actually changed the way I did bees. So uh, this is Dr. Leo, my friend here. You guys can uh, hear about what he's about here for one second and then we'll tell you what's going on in this video. Hi, I am Dr. Leo. I'm a natural beekeeper in the Ozarks of Southern Missouri. I catch local wild swarm and keep them in horizontal hives that require little maintenance and that's something that each of us can build from uh, some scrap lumber you have lying around. I also um, published books on natural beekeeping methods to make it uh, accessible for everyone. Uh, the main book to read is uh, Keeping Bees with a Smile. This is the new 2020 edition of this classical book on natural beekeeping, updated with more full color pictures and will get you off to a good start of how to never have to buy bees again once you catch local swarms. Yeah. And it is keeping bees with a smile instead of struggling to keep your bees alive. Natural beekeeping that has very low mortality rates is really accessible to everyone. Uh, a year ago, uh, at my suggestion, Doug set out what's called a bait hive or yeah. a swamp trap in the tree. It's just a small hive that you place in a tree and just as birds move into bird houses, the um, local bees, when they swarm, yeah. move into this uh, swamp trap. and. Uh, Doug had one swamp trap out and it got occupied by a local wild swarm, so it's a 100% success rate. Yeah. And uh, if you remember, a year ago when I visited, we were not working with live bees because all the previous bees that Doug had had perished during yeah. that winter. And we were talking about the reasons for this uh, high mortality. And well, one of the chief reasons is that you may not be uh, using and you may not be working with the bees acclimated to your local conditions. Right. So if you buy bees uh, in commerce, you never know where they were bred, what genetics they have. So catching local swarms is really the way to go. Yeah, and the climate too, like they are adjusted to that climate. So you guys will notice um, when we take you guys into the forest, that's what the hive that we caught as a live swarm last year. And the other box was actually a weak box that didn't have a queen, but we actually got a queen sent from our friend um, Mr. Rooster down there in Mississippi and he sent a uh, queen to us and we put that in the box so you guys are going to be able to see the difference on a queen that was brought in from a different climate in a different area how that box is doing versus one that was a swarm that came all together and acclimated to our local temperatures yeah uh, that's totally true yeah but the great thing is that once you caught the local swarm and you have this local genetics mm -hmm. in your beehives, you don't have to catch swarms every year right. anymore. You can increase the number of your hives by making artificial swarms, something that we're going to demonstrate today. Yeah. And uh, I have a new book called Raising Honeybee Queens that explains the methods for increasing the number of your hives and multiplying the colonies for yourself and even for sale. Literally, you don't need to buy bees again if you have good local genetics that survive their, the winter in your local conditions. Right, and actually he knows and is a proponent of, he can actually make more money with bees on, on the yard, the bee yard here, uh, than most people can make with cattle, right? And they don't disrupt the land. They don't, a lot of times when you see guys move in and they do cattle, the first thing they do is knock down all the trees, they want all the pasture, and then that disrupts all the natural habitat, right? Uh, that's totally correct. Yeah. And if you'd like to learn more about that, I invite you to come to the Homesteading Life Conference oh, yeah. that Doug and Stace are putting up in August in Hannibal, Missouri. Yeah. Uh, I'll be talking there and presenting to talks on natural beekeeping and multiplying your local bees. Right. And there the uh, techniques that we will be covering today are also described in the classical book by the French author George Deliens, who was the first to invent the horizontal high with the frames that we are using today. And they're called Keeping Bees in Horizontal High. And they're 
Uh, I also have a website with free plans for building hives like that and free information on catching your swarms and keeping bees naturally. It is horizontalhive.com. Yep, and we'll have that linked all over for you guys. So right now we're going to get into it because that sun is beating down on us. It does. And we're going to get into the shade and see what's going on with the bees. Uh, the use of smoke is a very ancient practice in beekeeping. Uh, even 4,000 years ago in Egypt, they knew that if you smoke bees when working with them, they will be more peaceful. And today we know that the reason for that is that uh, the smell of smoke means to the bee colony that there may be a wildfire around and that's an emergency. So instead of paying attention to you opening the hive, they prepare themselves for dealing with the emergency. They gorge themselves on honey because if it becomes too hot, uh, they may not have access to the frames with their honey because of all the smoke uh, and the temperature. So it may sound unnatural to smoke the bees, but actually if you need to open the nest as we do today, giving the bees some smoke is uh, less disruptive than opening it up without any smoke. I use burlap for smoker fuel. If you do the same, please make sure it comes from certified organic coffee bags because the ones that are not certified organic may be treated with all kinds of poisons to prevent fungi growth and that's not something that you want to burn and inhale while you're working your bees. And there is no right or wrong fuel for the smoker. Anything that will smolder like pine needles or even sawdust is a perfectly acceptable alternative. Uh, if you live in a place where sumac plants grow, the clusters of dry sumac berries are wonderful and they were shown in the research to also have antiviral mite properties. In the old days, uh, the favorite fuel of beekeepers was dried cow dung. But today, probably it's not a material easy to come by in uh, all of the places. All right, we're ready. Yeah, buddy. You know, for me, it's always a joy to see the bees so strong and healthy in the springtime. Yeah. But I also find it amazing that if we were to grab a few bees, put them in a Ziploc bag and send them to a lab to be examined for disease, they would find all kinds of disease agents with them. So that means that a healthy, strong colony, it's not the colony that is completely free of parasite or disease agents, right. but the one that has a strong immune system. Right. Such a wonderful message that the bees are. And then we get that from being cycled over and over in the same location, you're going to get the stronger bees with a better immune system. Correct. Which is just like us, the better our immune system is, the less likely we are to catch any of these things that could cause you problems. So, man, they are really outside the hive. Yeah, so that means they're very congested there and we have several options. We could expand the nest by adding more frames in front of the entrance to elevate the congestion and make it easier for the bees to ventilate. Uh, or we can uh, actually take half of the frames uh, and move them in a separate box to create two hives out of one. And some people may frown on that, mm -hmm. saying that's not really natural to mm -hmm. be splitting a colony like that. But for me, the definition of natural beekeeping is whether you are doing something that the bees want to accomplish themselves mm -hmm. or if you are working against their nature. Right. So when they're congested like that, if you did nothing, what would happen, they would swarm and half of the bees will fly out to occupy a new cavity and make two hives out of one. Right. So if you help them, almost being a midwife in right. the process, then it's totally natural because this is what the bees in this condition want to accomplish themselves. Right. I love it. Also, and we'll, you know, we'll have to look inside to know if they're strong enough to actually do that, right? Uh, yes, and also depends on your priorities. When they're as strong like that, if you were to keep them in the same box, just adding frames, then they could produce a very big harvest of honey for you because they have a lot of workers to go out, go out in the fields and collect nectar. 
but it's really important for the bees to go through this process of splitting every summer that's important for their health right. because while they're splitting and they're raising a new queen um, they don't have brood and brood the eggs and the larva of the bee is not just the young bees but also food for parasites so by going through the splitting cycle through natural swarming or through you doing the artificial swarm as described in keeping bees in horizontal hive book you help them cleanse themselves of uh, pathogens at the same time as you are increasing the number of hives right. and actually it doesn't go against the uh, increasing of honey production because while they're raising a new queen they don't have brood to feed so all the nectar that would be used for feeding more larva is now being used for storing more honey. All right, well, let's get in there and see what's going on. You want to give some smoke at the entrance. Don't blow it into the hive. It just alerts the bees at the entrance that, hey, there may be wildfire. We need to be paying attention to this danger rather than the two big polar bears breaking into our home. Maybe ants living under the cover that happens all the time and uh, I've never seen them bother the bees but it also depends on your climate in some climates the uh, ants are so aggressive like places where there are fire ants that you will want the bottom of your legs on the hive to be immersed in containers with water or oil uh, better water so that the ants cannot crawl up into the hive uh, also an important word of precaution, see how this rope is almost uh, going to um, burst. So this prevents the top from opening all the way out and breaking the hinges. So when you build yours, it's better to have a piece of wire, like regular fencing wire here instead of the rope. And that's one thing we need to do uh, in the next uh, month to prevent any disappointment from the thing breaking off. Many times you can estimate how big the colony is by putting the palms of your hands on the top uh, planks covering the nest. And right here at the entrance side, it's much, much warmer than in the far end of the hive. So you'll be able to see how congested mm -hmm. this part is and the relatively few bees in the far end of the box. Okay, let's look inside. If you see many drones, the male bees, that means that the colony has the resources for raising the, uh, the males. And they only do it when the colony is strong and uh, has the reserves of honey and their adequate uh, worker force. The workers being female for feeding these drones uh, that serve the important function of carrying on the wonderful genetics of this colony to the next generation. So as you can see, uh, this whole box is pretty much full of bees. Uh, here the frames are full of calm. So as we're going through the nest, I'm confident that we have sufficient resources here to separate this colony into two parts and have uh, two hives instead of one. Yeah, this procedure is called the artificial swarming in the old books. Today it's called the split and uh, it's described in keeping bees in horizontal hives by lay ants and also in raising honeybee queens uh, by Jules Ferre. How defensive the bees are uh, really depends not just on the colony itself but on the environmental conditions. There are certain times of the year when they are more gentle, uh, on other days they will be more defensive like what we have today. Uh, with uh, a horizontal hive you pretty much have to open the brood nest only once or twice a year in the spring to make sure that the queen is there and laying eggs. But this inspection today is so late, we really don't have to do that because it's obvious that the queen is in great shape 
judging by the strong population of the colony. And another reason for doing it is to assess whether you can multiply these five and have several colonies in place of one. So you can see here that in this brood section are, uh, portion of the hive near the open entrance. There are lots of bees, a lot of comb construction and it's fairly congested. And in this far end of the hive there are significantly fewer bees. So one thing you could do, you could move some of the frames from the far away section of the hive in front of the entrance to give them more room to build, to expand and to raise more brood and collect honey. I know last year when we were talking about the bees that these are a little darker than normal. Oh yeah, you know, remember how we talked about exactly. how dark they are? Exactly, because historically the first bees that were brought to America were the European dark bee. Uh, the strain of bee native to the north of uh, Europe. And they have much better winter survival and they're very good resistance against the varroa mites in many parts of their range. And when you see darker bees, they don't have as many yellow stripes on them that suggest that uh, it's a mixture of the prevailing Italian blood with these European dark bees, which is very good. And some of the queens that I have, they're almost peach black. I'll grab another box so that as we are going through the frames I have another box to put the frames in and there if you have a very strong nest like that and it's overflowing with bees and you want to create another hive you need to take half the frames with larvae and eggs and put them in another box together with the bees and all and take the box some 50 feet away the beauty right. of the simple method described by George de Lienz and keeping bees with a smile is that uh, you do not need to find the queen. Whichever half of this uh, artificial swarm that has no queen will be able to raise themselves a new queen from the eggs that they have in the car. And how long does that normally take? Uh, one month from now when you check them you will have a new queen already laying eggs. Wow. Two weeks from now she will already be there hatched but uh, she needs some additional time to go and mate with drones and then go into the egg production mode. Right. If you are trying to take the frame out and it's not coming out, not because it's glued with some propolis to be resin that they collect from the trees, but because it just doesn't want to get out feeling stuck, don't force it out because it could be that there is some honeycomb that's built between the frames linking them together. Right. Uh, and if you rip the comb apart, there will be honey running all over, aggravating the bees. So if you try pulling it up and it doesn't work, just try a different frame, a few frames down. Okay. Beautiful strong colony, lots of drones, of reserves. This powder at the bottom of these cells is a bee bread, which is fermented pollen, the source of protein and also a probiotic. And uh, this whole frame is also filled with fresh nectar that will be dripping out of the frame if you tilt it. The frames that look like covered with sandpaper is a brood, that means the sealed larva that are undergoing the metamorphosis to emerge as adult bees. So the frame of reserves 
for now to make our manipulations easier I will put this into a separate box when I do so I put frames there with foundation on both sides so that the bees are feel that they're, they're surrounded by enclosures and they don't feel alarmed or over finding themselves in some big empty space. Alright. So normally when I go over a hive during the spring inspection I carry a pencil with me and I just put marks on the top bars here telling me what the frame has. B for brood, O for open brood, meaning eggs and larvae, E for eggs, or D for drone brood. And this is helpful because uh, remember if you want to make two or more hives out of one by simply separating the colony in several parts, it's very important that each part has uh, freshly laid, laid eggs in there. This is what the colony needs to raise themselves a new queen if they don't have a queen. Look at this beautiful frame of brood. It also has some unsealed brood, the larva, in the bottom of the cells. And when you see this, it's sure indication that the queen is there and very, very fertile. artificial swarm you need to give her a new split at least two full frames of brood and one frame of reserves meaning pollen and nectar but because this hive is literally overflowing with bees uh, we'll be able to borrow some more frames from there and uh, Doug, if you would like to make more colonies out of this hive, or, uh, you could split it in two or even three parts. All right. It's doing that good. <laughs> you know, another thing that you cannot see on the video is that how wonderful it smells. When you open a hive like that, there is all the smell of uh, propolis and uh, fresh nectar being evaporated yeah and uh, pollen brought into the hive all right so another frame of reserve sir brood and I'm looking at the bottom of the cells for eggs and this frame does have some eggs at the bottom of cells there. They look like tiny like tiny grains of rice. So this is what they're looking for in order to give the split and the mother colony some uh, something to start a new queen from. I would recommend that we do the spring inspection much earlier. Yeah, I know the it was just been crazy. Yeah. It was, but the bees inside were still active, and yeah. there, if we did this six weeks ago, it would be a much less uh, stressful experience for the bees because there would be fewer bees, and it would make our work easier. Okay, this one has eggs. And uh, with my pencil, I will write on this frame that it has eggs. So this way I know they're able to raise their queen from some cells there. When the comb is dark and old, like on this frame, it really helps notching the cells with their, the eggs to make it easier for the bees to transform them into queen cells. These dark cells have a lot of cocoons which makes it difficult for the bees to extend and change the shape of the cell to turn an ordinary cell into a queen cell. So by 
notching some of the cells and opening them up, this work will be easier for bees to accomplish. If you had very young yellow comb with this, you wouldn't have to do the notching. When you do so, pay attention to where the eggs are at the bottom of the cells, so you don't damage the eggs or the tiny larvae there. And also, if you have a frame with eggs, this is where the queen is more likely to be. So handle the frame over the hive, so in case she falls from the frame, she falls into the hive and not in the grass. So you drive your hive tool under the cell, almost to the midrib, and then down. Yes, you sacrifice a few cells down, but you open up the space for the bees to transform this cell into a queen cell. Otherwise, these are old cocoons that are very rigid are in the way, which makes it different for the bees to change the shape of the uh, cell from the regular worker cell into a big cell that looks like a peanut, something like that. This is the beginning of a queen cell. So doing this operation with the cells with tiny eggs and tiny larvae makes the work easier for the bees. When you make this artificial swarm, uh, all the foragers from this box will go back to their mother hive because they're so close together. For this reason, make sure that it's very strong and has efficient bees in there to compensate for the loss of the foragers. Wow, another great frame of capped brood. The capped brood will soon uh, emerge and become our worker bees. And it's good to give her plenty of that to the new colony to replenish her the loss of the foragers that stay behind in the original mother hive. And again, we're making this uh, probably twice as strong as what's really necessary. A successful split with just two frames of brood and uh, fresh eggs and one frame of uh, honey and pollen reserves would be totally sufficient. Okay, now we have plentiful uh, resources in the box, brood, honey, and uh, pollen. What I'm looking for is another frame with uh, a lot of uh, freshly laid eggs. And this portion of the hive is so congested that the, bee, the queen bee would be moving into the depth of the hive to lay more eggs. So we are more likely to find the frames with eggs farther away from the entrance. So let's look in here. The extra bees clustering on the top bars, I will just pick in this box to strengthen its population. And let's look at some frames in this portion to see if we have a frame way there young larva and eggs. Not a good 
propolis. A lot of propolis, uh, which is uh, great for the bees and for you. As you are working with the hive, I, I always carry a small box with me. And if you scrape some of the extra propolis with your hive tool, you can make uh, tinctures. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, for your own consumption as immune system booster and fighting pathogens. In the old days before uh, toothpaste was invented, this is what people were using for purifying the mouth. Right. Just uh, chewing some resin, either resin of trees or bee resin that the bees have collected from the trees and their plants. Yourselves. So, here is a frame of drone brood. Lots of these bigger cells that are kept looking like bullets. And maybe keepers try to prevent uh, the construction of these cells because drones just consume honey without gathering any nectar. But for the health of the bee colony and proper procreation, they need to raise a lot of drones. Those drones are big! They are. But they have no stinger, so they yeah. may be buzzing around you quite intimidatingly, but they cannot sting you. The queen does have a stinger, but uh, she only uses it on another queen when they are competing for control over the hive. The queen does not sting beekeepers unless you grab her in your pan. pollen, bee bread, honey, kept and left from the winter, uh, and brood. Everything's looking pretty normal, pretty strong? Oh, it's very strong. Again, you could easily make her uh, like three hives out of one right now. Wow. But uh, we're making just one, that means it will be a very strong split. Brood. You see they're lightened up a little bit out front. They're worried about what's going on inside. But they did drop down a little under, underneath there. I did my inspections in early March this year. The weather was very nice and warm. And their early inspections are just easier to carry out because there are significantly fewer bees. Sure. Then you set them up for the part of the season and you don't have to disrupt their nest when they're very active like this. And we're, again we're not really looking for the queen we're just kind of looking around seeing what's up. We are no we are uh, uh, not looking for the queen but we are looking for some more eggs to make sure that both the split and the parent colony has our eggs to raise a queen from. If we found the queen, and for example, we know that the queen stays here uh, with the mother colony, then we'll only need to make sure that the split has the eggs. But because it's quite difficult to find the queen in a very strong hive like this, uh, we make sure that uh, there are eggs in both portions. Right. Now here we have some cross combing happening. Uh, bees connected two frames together with wild comb. And there, you may see it probably more with their plastic foundation than with natural wax. All right, so I'll grab one more frame with brood from the brood section and put it in the in the new box and I will add a few frames from the far away section of the hive in front of the entrance. They will build it out quicker this way.
Uh, keeping the brood frames together makes it easier for the bees to heat the brood at night. It's especially important early in the spring when the temperatures at night are very low. So by moving some uh, frames and putting them in front of the entrance, you are creating uh, more room for them to build in front of the entrance without uh, increasing congestion in the box. If they were to continue to build comb in the depth of the hive, it makes the travel distance from the entrance to the far away portion of the box much more and this would create traffic jams and traffic jams inside the hive is one of the causes of swarming mm. by giving them more space in front of the entrance you alleviate the natural urge to swarm right so you can uh, make your own uh, artificial swarms or splits as they're called today because they're almost thinking they're running out of room so exactly right and it's not like they're thinking, the way they perceive it is by smell, right. uh, by the smell of the queen. When they become very congested, the queen pheromone cannot as easily circulate through the hive as uh, when there is room. And when the queen pheromone cannot circulate, they they lose the smell of the queen, which may mean the queen may not even be there. Right and they go into the queen making, queen business. making road, yeah. <laughs> right. Because it's survival of the fittest, right? They know what they have to do to keep their line alive. Yeah, and they do it so differently every year depending on the weather conditions. That's amazing. Right. You know, this is why I do not practice feeding. In almost all beekeeping literature written today tells you you need to feed your bees in the spring so they build up a strong population. We'll see how strong the population of the bees can build up without any without feeding. It, right. Just eating their, nat uh, mm -hmm. their natural diet of honey and pollen. Also, if you were to feed your bees sugar, mm, you are not creating the same kind of resilient bee that's been there. Uh, Right. raised there on a diet of natural pollen and nectar which is nutritionally far superior to the sugar water that beekeepers give their bees. We actually oh. used to do the sugar water and then through the reading of your books and meeting you and working with you through the beekeeping and natural beekeeping we haven't given the sugar water in years to the bees so and they seem healthier you know for it. Very good. Mm -hmm. All right, so this is all complete. We need to give one more frame for them to build here. And a couple of frames with foundation into this box. And we'll carry it some distance away and put it on a separate step. Okay, when you make this artificial swarm, you want to move this box a certain distance away. Uh, if uh, you don't, then many of the bees in this box will fly out trying to locate their queen and if the queen is still in this box, right. they will go back to the queen, depleting the population of bees in this hive. Right. Moving it a certain distance away pre prevents the young house bees from going out of the box trying to find the queen and congregating back in the original box. About 50 feet? Um, yeah, ideally, if you have space or something like 50 feet, it's a very good distance. Okay. Look at this one here. Yeah, it's got a little weight to it. Want to make sure that the new box is off the ground? 
Uh, yes, and also if you eventually transfer it into a permanent hive that will be on supports, on cinder blocks or on mm -hmm. legs, it's best for the bees for their orientation if the entrance to the permanent box a month from now is at the same height of mm -hmm. the ground as where it is now. Do you think that'll work? Yes. And then if your high will be on the higher stand than that, then our they will reorient and find a new entrance. Right. So this is the complete first step in creating an artificial swarm. Whether it's successful or not, we'll know in four weeks time when we open the box and look for eggs. If you see bee eggs in three weeks from, four weeks from now, uh, that means that they've raised the new queen and the queen su successfully mated and started laying eggs. So this will be a fully established new colony at that point. So if you haven't hit that subscribe button, make sure you do it right now and get the notifications because in four more weeks we're going to be out here and we're going to show you guys exactly what's going on. Now we're going to go check the other hive. Yeah, I'm really anxious to see how this queen is comparing to the other queen. Well, even judging by the activity at the entrance of the hive, there is a big difference. Yeah. All right, let's get in there and see what's going on. Yeah, but and also this hive has uh, trays for pest control underneath. So many times when you do a quick inspection to see what's going on, you can slide out these and you will see by where they're dropping bits of pollen and wax how big the brood chamber is without opening the entire box. Right. So here you can see that's approximately half um, the length of the hive, about 15 frames is active and the rest is still empty. It's a nice feature. Uh, you can fill these with oil, but oil becomes messy after a while when all of these, this material mixes with the oil or it can be filled with diatomaceous earth, which is much cleaner. Which is what we actually had. And we had some bad winds, I was explaining to you on the phone, that actually blew the hive over. Oh, I'm so and sorry. And that was coming that. right out of winter. So I oh, came wow. out really fast, I got it stood up, and then I put this blocker behind it. But it looks like they've done okay. And see, it's another important message. If you are looking at some models of beehive that you are using or I'm using on my website, and just apply this to your particular situation. If you are in an area with very strong winds, you may want to make the legs uh, spread out right. more or even drive a T-post right. at one of the legs and attach it solidly to the T-post to prevent it from tipping over in right. strong wind. Yeah, you would think it would be pretty heavy, but man, that wind was really crazy. Oh my. So here is the feature of this box. Instead of a piece of rope, there is wire that prevents it from breaking and the lid falling out completely when you open the hive. The thing we were talking about, if some people hadn't watched the other videos, is how we have these color-coded. Oh, oh, oh no. my! That's exactly what we were talking about. Yeah. If there is no frames. And there's frames, there's just a gap there, isn't it? There is a gap between the frames. That's very important to respect the spacing yes. and have frames continuously throughout the entire box yes. because if there's a gap they will be building come from the top cover board and when you open it up you're going to cause this problem with the yeah. honey and then going to get them excited and all kinds yeah. of problems. So what we need to do, we need to take a small bucket or container and uh, a knife and brush all the bees off and harvest uh, this honey and reinsert the frame. When something like that happens and there is a portion of the comb that collapsed, do not leave it like that. Right. You need to fix it and clean it up there because all of this collapsed comb can cause an infestation of small hive beetles and other right. uh, Things parasites that want to rob like, yeah. yeah, that the bees won't be able to get to them in this collapsed comb. So let's go ahead and fix that now. Yes. So smoking lightly, brushing them off.
you may not be able to save every single bee, but realize that uh, every hive has between one and two thousand new bees hatching every day. So the loss of some bees are, is not going to make a big difference. So this on the side, should we break that off? Uh, we should preferably cut, cut it, it off, off so it doesn't uh, spill more honey. Right. So you just take a very sharp knife, you cut it off at the base, and... <laughs> and you eat it! Mm -hmm. Make sure there are no bees on, on the spill. Mm. Yeah. So now you can see that the, there's honey down in the bottom there in the tray, so we'll have to clean that out as well, right? Yes, please. Otherwise, there may be other critters getting there to eat honey, and that's not accessible to the bees. Right. So, so I can't protect it. Mm -hmm. I'm making a quick inspection to make sure I don't see a dead queen and on the screen, and there is none, which is fortunate. Have spilled honey, preferably clean it up as you go so you don't have more bees stuck in honey as you are handling the frames or the cover boards. Here are the lazy drones enjoying their sweet life. <laughs> and when a bee becomes uh, covered in honey like that, uh, it's all right because other bees will lick it up. So this bee will survive and do good. All right, now let's open a few more boards and uh, see what we have there. So clearly we are now looking at the honey section and some of this comb has kept honey probably from the last fall. Did you harvest any honey in the fall? No, we left it so they could have it to go mm -hmm. into winter, yeah. And there again I see some cross combing, the comb interconnected. So I don't want to rip this apart. And we'll go farther until we see some frames that don't have any cross common them. And then we'll look at these. Yeah, that's a completely different vibration compared to the previous hive. Not only in the quantity of bees, but here I can take my hood off and there just be working with these bees with no protection and this explains why one of the reasons why people wanted to replace their local bees with southern queens uh, the Italian bees that are number one most widespread commercial bee in America are much more gentle so you can handle them with little protection with their impunity but local bees can often be capable of standing their ground. Here is a queen cup that they started building. Oh yeah, look at that. This is the shape of a peanut that the bees are constructing in preparation for swarming. Eventually the queen will lay an egg in this opening and it will be transformed in a complete queen cell where the new queen will be raised at which point the old mother queen with half the bees in the hive will fly off to establish a new colony. So they're kind of getting crowded enough yeah, where they feel like they need to make Because even half the hive this size, 15 frames, are, that's a lot of bees and certainly strong enough to be swarming. So I'm not surprised if you find enough brood and resources in this box too to make another split if you like. And because these have much more room and fewer bees, we could make the split in the same box by inserting a divider and turning this one hive into two. Mm -hmm. We'll open an additional entrance, and this way you will have uh, two colonies living in uh, the same box temporarily. Uh, whichever half has no queen will raise themselves a new queen. After one month, you check for eggs. If you don't see eggs in one of the half, that means that uh, they weren't able to requeen themselves for one reason or another, or maybe the queen didn't return from the mating flight. It right. sometimes happens when they're eaten up by the birds. Right. In which case, if the split failed, reuniting them is as easy as removing this plywood partition board and merging them together. Now, how hard is it to take that 
other hive out, you know, the other part out and put it into a new hive and move it? Uh, it will be very easy. You just transfer just the like frames we gonna do like we did. Yeah, exactly. Okay. Another sign of preparations for swarming is the abundance of drones and drone brood. Once the colony senses that they have the resources and the strength to procreate, they do two things. They start raising new queens to swarm and they also start raising a lot of drones because drones are the ones that will mate with queens from other hives. They do it outside the hive in flight to prevent inbreeding. So these are two pathways for the colony to get into its next generation. All right, lots of bees, lots of brood. Another knuckle. Very good. Another uh, queen cup. Yeah, queen cell and cup. And another one. Another one, you will see many of them, but if they are not sealed completely yeah. and have an opening in the bottom, that means that the queen has not yet laid there. So they'll actually make multiple ones so yes. she can pick one and then go in there. She will probably lay eggs in several of them. Oh, I see. And maybe on different days. Mm. And it serves her uh, a very important function for the bees. If the time comes to swarm and they're the weather is unfavorable. They're able to destroy one of the cells that has the queen that's about to emerge and just produce another one a few days later. This way, you know, some people thought that bees can foretell weather. Yes. But there is the simple explanation that they just hatch their bats and they create different cells aged uh, differently. So they have the flexibility of doing swarming when the conditions are the most favorable. The swarm will be hanging on a branch while the scouts are looking for a place to live. It could take uh, days for them to locate a new dwelling. Right. So it's very important for them that it is uh, done when the temperatures are high and the weather is uh, nice with no rain, especially no cold rain because this could drench and kill the colony, kill the swarm. Okay, brood. You can also tell the difference in the color of the bees and the drones. Do you see, Doug? Mm -hmm. These are very yellow. Right. Um, totally different look than the exactly. other box. The other one was much darker. Right. The bees were more defensive. Active. Right. And extremely prolific. Mm -hmm. Probably twice as many bees as here. Right. This one filled half the box. The other one was maybe 70% more frames are built and in terms of the quantity of the bees even more than what you see here So I will temporarily set this in the empty portion of the hive so we have room To work and inspect other frames. So basically old dirt, dirt rooster. He's got them lazy queens down there in the south <laughs> Well, you know the way uh, Winnie the Pooh said there is the right sort of bees and the wrong sort of bees. Right. And there is nothing wrong with this sort of bees except that they are not acclimated to these conditions. Right, right. The bees that will do great in Mississippi or Florida are not the bees that will do great in Missouri or farther north right. and vice versa. Right, right. The but same way as if you take an oak tree from Minnesota and plant it in Florida, it will not thrive there either. Right. That totally makes sense. Okay, lots and lots of nectar and brood. And drones. I'm not seeing any empty cells or cells with their eggs. Because I suspect that here too they were running out of room and they filled everything with nectar. So next year let's do this inspection sometime in March. Yeah.
Another word of precaution, if you make an inspection like that on a colder day, right now we're sweating over because it's 80 degrees. Yeah. If you do it when it's 60 degrees, then uh, make sure you don't expose the hive for too long. Right. Because the drop of the temperature may be detrimental to the development of brood. It's called brood because the bees brood on their uh, cells filled with the larva and the nymphs the same way as chickens brood on their eggs. Oh, there you go. Right. They need to maintain their high temperature of around 95 degrees right. for the eggs to develop properly. And this is, by the way, the reason why women bear children inside their bodies uh, for nine months. One of the reasons is to maintain the optimal temperature for the development of the fetus. Right. Oh, look at this cell. Yeah, right there. Yeah. Now, this is a capped cell. Wow. So that means they're making a queen right now. They're making a queen right now and... Two of them. Look at that. There is another one that's capped. Which means that we can uh, make a split right here using the queen cell that already capped. Right. And they're accelerating the process of them creating a new colony. So this peanut shaped cell in the center covered with bees is a queen cell. And if it's completely sealed at the tip that means that the larva of the queen has already matured to the point where it will spin a cocoon after the cell is sealed and the queen will emerge in a few days. Here is one. There is another one. Yeah, you can see the other ones were hollow and this has got this is all closed in. Mhm. Mm It's another feature of the southern queens uh, and southern bees that you got is that uh, they will uh, be building more cells and swarming more readily than local bees because they live uh, in a warmer climate when they can uh, more swarming. Often. Yeah, yeah. swarming more often. Right. So that's great. We have the resources for making a split right here. And it's helpful if these frames have natural beeswax foundation. This has plastic, so it will be impossible to cut out the cell. But if it was wax, we could cut out the cell and put it in one corner of the hive and leave the other one with this section of the hive. But let's look, we may have more um, queen cells on other frames too. And if we do, we'll divide there the colony in half, leaving a queen cell in each portion and open another entrance. And after inserting a plywood divider board, the split will be complete. And it's all, almost uh, certain that it will succeed because they raised their own queen. Right. It's almost ready to hatch. And they have plentiful, plentiful resources of brood, nectar and pollen. Wow, what a different picture compared to what we witnessed a year ago. Yeah, or even just 20 minutes ago. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, some people write to me that it becomes overwhelming because most beekeepers have the problem of keeping their bees alive. Right. And many of We have people, a problem where to put them exactly, all. Exactly, <laughs> because it keeps multiplying so quickly. It's almost like, you know, you have no more containers in your household for holding food and it just keeps just being produced like in your garden. Right. Okay. For a successful uh, split or artificial swarm as they were called in the old days you need several things you need their uh, sufficient amount sufficient amount of brood because the portion of the split with no queen will not have any egg production for a while so you need them to have enough brood to raise a new generation of bees in the absence of the queen while they're raising a new queen 
you need a sufficient number of bees to take care of the brood and take care of the queen cells, heating them and feeding them. Right. And you need sufficient amount of reserves of pollen and nectar so that if it rains for a week or two weeks and the weather is unfavorable for foraging, right. they still have all the food to, and they need to sustain themselves. And here is another queen cell, congratulations. Wow. It's sealed. We're having a baby! Yes, and <laughs> we, and here is another one. Wow! What it also means is that uh, if Doug wanted to go right now to 10 hives instead of two hives, right. we would have had the resources of uh, making eight additional hives from two. I know oh you are goodness. not prepared, no. but uh, you know that's one of the biggest problems of uh, natural beekeeping right. is that uh, the, it can become overwhelming. with they're state. healthy. They're healthy, they're strong, and right. they keep multiplying. That's right. what bees do. So you know some of the people ask me after watching the previous video, does this recipe of uh, frying some of the dead bees in olive oil and then rubbing into your oh. scalp for promoting uh, hair, hair growth. growth. Does it really work? And uh, it seems to work. I do it, uh, but I never had enough dead bees to do it regularly. <laughs> you got to hang around some of those regular beekeepers. <laughs> yeah, yeah. All right. And I also wanted to point out that many times the beekeepers blame everything on pesticide. Right saying, oh, it's the pesticide that are killing my bees. Right. But look, here, Doug is in the country where he is surrounded by commercial agriculture, and he cannot control where the bees will go to. Certainly, in addition to his organic clover growing around his homestead, they will also go to the fields with corn for corn uh, pollen, right. and to soybeans or whatever else they can find within two miles. And much of it, or probably most of it, will not be organic food, but they still are thriving. Which tells you that number one imp most important thing in natural beekeeping is to be working with local bees. Right. I've seen it. Okay, very good. So this uh, frame has uh, the queen cell, and we're leaving it here. So now each end will have queen cells. Yeah. So how to make a split and horizontal hive? We made an inspection of the brood nest and we discovered two frames with their swarm cells. The big cells that look like peanuts where they are raising a new queen in preparation for swarming. This way we can put one frame with their, the swarm cell on one end of the hive, the other one stays behind where it was, and we are also separating the frames with brood pretty much 50-50 between the two portions of the hive. Uh, realizing though that this original brood nest will receive all the foragers coming back from the field so we can give more brood to the new split inside the same box because they won't have any foragers originally but the new bees hatching from the brood frames will strengthen the population of this new split. So I will go through the uh, remaining frames and I will move a few more brood frames into this new compartment. So there are three frames with brood and resources on the original left side of the nest. There are only two in the other one. So I'm taking another full frame of brood and bees and adding it to the newly formed artificial swarm or split. Let me take at least one more. I had to take my hat off, it was getting so hot, so I'm back into the old hat, straw hat. There you go. Dog the bee whisperer. <laughs> All right. Looks like we have some kind of brood and comb down here in the bottom, isn't it? Yeah, another regular construction. So let us actually clean it up now that we have it exposed. Would you eat that dark stuff? I do. Yeah. Uh, the dark calmer usually is the one where deposits of bee bread are. Mm -hmm. Actually when you had your camera switched off changing batteries I was uh, feasting on some uh, um, bee pollen. 
which is very good for you. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. One, two, three, four, five. Let me take mm -hmm. one more frame from here. Also understanding that many of the bees that we are now transferring to the new compartment are foragers. They will fly out of the newly opened entrance tomorrow morning and they will return to this original portion of the hive. Right. So tomorrow the population of the newly formed there split won't be as impressive as it is today. But no worry, they'll mo they'll still maintain some over there because they're protecting those they will. Queen cells and exactly. Stuff. The house bees that don't fly out the hive, the younger bees, they're called nurses. Right. Uh, they will stay in the new compartment and when they become foragers, when they become older they will know that entrance as the only entrance to their hive and will stay in that portion. Right. I'm trimming some of the comb again. Okay, now that I've split uh, the resources in two halves, more or less, I am putting three frames with foundation in front of the open entrance of the original uh, nest to give them more room to build and not feel as congested. This way we hope that when they do raise a new queen they will uh, stay here rather than swarm. And then I slide everything back together. In this case, because there is some cross coming on these frames, we want to be able to slide there all five frames as one unit. So I'm breaking the properly seal on each side, but don't actually separate the frames completely so I can just slide them together without ripping apart the comb that they connected the frames with. And I'm sliding all five frames together. Okay, then I will add some more foundation here so they don't attach a comb to the divider board that we will place in the middle. And I give some frames of foundation to the newly formed colony. And that I will also put in front of the entrance, sliding the rest of the frames into the depth of the hive. Again, adding foundation in front of the entrance helps alleviate congestion because this is where all the foragers are arriving. This is the busiest spot in the hive. So here we go, we have divided this hive in two halves and each half has a queen cell, uh, pollen, honey, brood and all the resources to become a self-sufficient uh, uh, colony. The only thing we need now is to put a piece of uh, plywood completely separating the two compartments so they become our new independent bee colonies. First, the Leans tells you in his book Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives that as you gain experience with the bees, you often want to work with them with no gloves so you have more feeling in your hands. Yeah. And just a word of precaution, the bee sting, unless you're allergic, is not going to hurt you. Yeah. Uh, but uh, make sure that you remove all the rings with you from, your sting, uh, from your fingers before going to the bee yard. <laughs> because if it starts swelling, the ring may cut off blood circulation yeah. to the finger. Lose a finger. Lose a finger, lose the ring. Yeah. Man. 
and going to the emergency room is not really helpful because what they will do in the emergency room they will just cut the ring <laughs> and your wife will not like it <laughs> no. if it happens to you and it happened to me once and if it is on the wedding ring then you can save the ring if it's too late uh, to take it off because the finger is swollen by applying uh, a lot of ice and elevating your hand for several hours right. and by all means if it starts turning purple then it's critical you will have to cut the ring regardless right and you guys know too that if you do get a bee sting you don't want to grab the stinger out because at the end of that stinger there's a little ball of uh, the juice that they shoot in you what do you call it venom venom and if you squeeze it to get it out you're gonna push it in deeper and you're gonna cause your bite to be worse so actually you want to scrape it right great with a credit card or a fingernail or your um, hive tool your hive tool but you want to scrape across there and have it scrape right out Okay, next time I come, I will demonstrate. Yeah, well, there you go. Okay, this hive is ready for the piece of plywood to be inserted in the middle. Mm -hmm. And we are opening a second entrance. And you have four colonies instead of two at the end of Just this like day. that. Yeah. All right, let's go get that board. So the only thing left is to insert the divider between the two colonies that we have made out of one. And I asked Doug for a piece of plywood and he told me he didn't have any plywood around. The only thing he had was a piece of uh, oak from the cabin that he's building. So we use that and uh, we're inserting it between the two, close to the last frame, all the way down to the bottom of the hive. And so it separates it in two parts and goes all the way to the cover board so the bees cannot cross above the divider either. Pay attention to where you are putting it so that it's not against the entrance slot, the one that's in the middle. Otherwise the bees will be able to use the entrance slot to go around this uh, divider. So it needs to be separating the two colonies and two halves completely so there is no communication. Because the walls of the hive that's built out of natural wood may be slightly irregular, if you see any crack or, uh, between the divider and the wall of the hive that looks like big enough for a bee mm -hmm. to go through, then you need to put uh, some propolis, this big glue that to scrape off any of the surfaces in the hive, or s a small amount of beeswax to cover this gap to completely seal the two compartments. You don't need to do it if the walls are of the hive and the divider board have a gap less than sixteenth of an inch or sixteenth of an inch. One eighth of an inch is pretty much the borderline. Anything bigger than that and the bees can go back and forth and then the split will not be as successful. We want them to function as two self-sufficient new bee colonies. So we're not going to put this on there because the board's blocking it. Uh, correct. Right. But keep it here, preferably under the hive, so it doesn't get warped from exposure to rain. Right. And we'll use it when uh, we relocate the half of the colony that we created into a box of their own. But the only thing left for today is to open the entrance. Oh, right. Use your hive tool uh, to take out the material that was blocking the entrance. Uh, and they're well done. Well, we got it done right before the sun went down, didn't we? Mm -hmm. <laughs> Tell you what, you don't think the bees are so much work, but it actually takes a little bit to get in there and get to them, isn't it? It is, but uh, I really enjoy working with the bees. Yeah, for sure. Because in our society, we are being raised to work with their 
bad objects. Right. Even computers, and they're, they're very predictable. <laughs> right. You press a button and you have a result. With the bees, you need to be fully alive and open, open up your senses because you're communicating and interacting with the living being. Yeah, I mean, they know your vibrations, they know your smells, they know everything. You can tell when, I mean, I was telling him, I was been watching the bees, even though I hadn't really worked with them. But I could tell they, that one hive that was the swarm hive, that was a pretty, it was pretty busy in there. They had a lot of dancing, a lot of communication going on where the other hive, uh, as you guys noticed on this film, uh, that it was a lot less activity, you know. Even though the colony was very healthy and yeah, it was strong, good, strong. Yeah. and prepared for swarming naturally or being divided artificially right. as we did with you. And if you would like to learn more, the resources to go to are uh, the three books on natural beekeeping that I uh, edited and published and translated from Russian and French. The two procedures we were doing today, separating the horizontal hive in two parts so that the part with no queen raises a new queen and uh, you get two colonies instead of one. Uh, and the other procedure when we actually took frames, put them in a different box and moved the box certain distance away, that's called artificial swarming and this is described by George de Lienz in the classical book on natural beekeeping called Keeping Bees in Horizontal Hives. So we just took that information from the book and showed you guys real time, putting our hands on it, moving the bees, walked you through this whole long video so you could learn on all that information that are in these books and make sure you guys, if you're interested in beekeeping or you have a friend that does, they make great uh, coffee table books and also gifts for people uh, who are interested in beekeeping make sure you check out his website we're gonna leave it linked down below it's gonna flash across the screen horizontalhive.com correct and again my favorite book is keeping bees in uh, with a smile and that's what it is all about not just having healthy bees and plentiful honey yeah but having a smile at the same time yeah because there's a lot of times that I've left all the honey on there just to make sure that they could survive the winter and be um, organic that I wouldn't need to give them any more help than they need naturally but I can tell you Doug that this year not only you will end the summer with more colonies than you had originally but also will have plentiful honey that's good so hopefully you guys enjoyed this video if you didn't smash the subscribe button make sure you do it we're gonna have a video coming up in about four weeks and we're gonna walk you guys through this whole process how each one of those systems worked uh, the, the how they did we're gonna move them into the new hive and a lot of neat stuff coming up and don't forget to check out horizontalhive.com also uh, Dr. Leo will be speaking at the Homesteading Life Conference. That's in August 2nd and 3rd in Hannibal, Missouri. That function is fully going, guys. Nothing's going to stop that function from going on. So if you haven't got your tickets, it's almost sold out. And we hope to see you guys there. And also, when you go to his website, horizontalhive.com, you'll be able to look at some of the classes that he offers at his property. And he takes you guys to his bee yards and also goes through those classes with you as well. And stay tuned because in the future, we're going to be doing a class together at his property. Uh, that you guys will be able to attend and that'll be a lot of fun too so yeah i look forward to it Doc. yeah and i thank you for always coming up you know it's about a five hour drive for him to come up and make these videos for you guys so you can learn all this great information so make sure you leave a comment down below and just say thanks dr leo for investing all this time uh to come up here and hang out with you guys so hope you guys enjoyed the video make sure you leave your comment down below and we'll see you guys on the next video Whew. well that was a busy day oh. <laughs>